Let's recite together the collect, which is printed in your bulletin. Risen Christ, your wounds declare your love for the world and the wonder of your risen life. Give us compassion and courage to risk ourselves for those we serve. To the glory of God, our Father, amen. Welcome. We're glad that you decided to join us this morning at First United Methodist Church on this beautiful day. Uh, let's begin this morning with our opening processional hymn, number 578, God of Love and God of Power, all verses. Let us remain standing and unite in the historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed, which is printed in your bulletin and can also be found on 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascendeth into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor. 
Uh, Terry Stubblefield, our associate, is out today. He is attending his grandson's graduation in Birmingham this afternoon. And I think Calvin and I might be able to handle everything without him. But we sure do miss him when he's not here. I love what Terry brings to our congregation. And so if you're visiting and you haven't had a chance to meet Terry, come back next week because Terry will be here. And... um, It'll be a treat. I want to welcome those who are joining us online as well. We're so glad that you're with us. And I want to encourage you to participate in worship in every way possible. Uh, All of the liturgy will be on the screen in front of you. And and feel free to to pray the prayers and and to sing the songs and just to, to be a part. Also want to encourage you to go to our website, fumcflow.org. And there you can register your attendance or even there on Facebook in the comments section. You can just let us know that you were with us today. And if there's any way that we can be of service to you, please, by all means, let us know. Likewise, those of you who may be visiting in here today, if there's anything we can do to make your stay more pleasant, uh, please let us know uh, because we would love to do whatever we can. And the folks here, I want to encourage you to fill out your registration slip. The connection card is part of the worship guide. And in just a few moments when the offering plates are passed, you can put your completed card in there. I want to share with you some great activities coming up this afternoon from 4 to 7 p.m. at Veterans Park. Our Bicentennial Committee is hosting a church-wide family picnic. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. Uh, we'll have barbecue served at 5 p.m. And um, uh, they'll bring chairs, sunscreen, whatever you need to be comfortable. And just come enjoy, uh, enjoy the fellowship and the fun uh, that we have in store for you. Our Wednesday evenings, uh, we have the last one before we take a couple of weeks off this Wednesday evening. And Terry is doing an adult study And we will have children's activities, but we will not have youth activities this Wednesday. Mac, our youth director, is in Austin, Texas today. She'll be graduating this afternoon with her seminary degree. And so the next time you see her, be sure to offer her a word of congratulation. But she's going to go and visit family in New York before she comes back uh, 1st of June, hitting the ground running Uh, as our full-time youth director. Let's see, what else? Crafted Conversations is this Thursday, May 19th at 7 p.m. at Singing River Brewing. And uh, we're in the live room, and our guest musician this time is Lenny LeBlanc. And our topic for dialogue is nature versus nurture. And we'd love for you to come and to be a part of this great event. I've already shared with you that this is last, Sam's last Sunday with us, and uh, we're so grateful. Uh, uh, Sam came to us in October of 20, and um, we appreciate what he's been able to bring to our music program uh, since then, but he's leaving uh, to go to the University of Kansas to work on a PhD. Um, we had a reception uh, in the atrium at 9.30 this morning, Uh, but if you haven't had a chance to offer well wishes, be sure to grab him before uh, he gets out of here this morning. Let him know how much we appreciate what he's provided to us. Thank you, Sam. We live in a crazy world. There's a lot going on, and there's all kinds of needs that just keep popping up. Uh, You know, over uh, the last couple of months now, we've been um, uh, sending relief money to Ukraine through the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, The um, annual conference, the North Alabama Annual Conference that we'll meet uh, towards the end of of June uh, is planning a special offering uh, that um, churches are to take to the annual conference meeting for the Baltic states Uh, with whom we already have a relationship in this church, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, But a lot of the the plight of the refugees uh, has landed on their doorsteps, and so they're working to bring about relief there. And our annual conference, because of our past association 
uh, with the Baltic area uh, is going to be taking a special offering to help them in their relief efforts there. And, but we can continue to give through the United Methodist Committee on Relief, but I just wanted you to be aware that we're going to be doing an offering uh, for the Baltics um, uh, here shortly in the next couple of weeks, and um, hopefully you'll be able to give generously to that, which I have no doubt that you will because you always give generously. If you know there's a need, you respond to it. Uh, you're just that kind of folks, and it's great to be a part of a congregation like that. And so as we prepare to receive our offering this morning, I invite Calvin to come forward and to offer a prayer of consecration over our gifts. Calvin? Lord, we thank you for the ministries of this church. We thank you for each of member of this church. Those members also who use their spiritual gifts to bless others. We thank you for the rich fellowship that we enjoy with one another. But also
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, <clears throat> in whom we live and move and have our very being, you created us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your light may we see life clearly and in your service find perfect freedom as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as he taught them saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from 1 John chapter 4, the 7th through the 21st verse. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The command we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> we're continuing our journey toward loving our neighbors in the way that Jesus loves us. But I think today I want to say that we're at an intersection. Most of us live with the illusion that love just happens. We talk about love as if we're merely victims of a fickle emotion that haphazardly waxes and wanes like the moon's cycles. The truth is that love is a choice that requires commitment and discipline, two traits that are that are at odds with our culture's preoccupation with the selfish pursuit of instant gratification. We want love to be easy and stress-free. However, loving others is not easy. It's complicated. We must set aside our selfish impulses, 
especially when the people that we're trying to love are difficult or even mean. Sometimes it's just easier not to care, so we simply distance ourselves from those who may be hard to love. So, like I say, I think we're at an intersection where we have a choice. Will we default to the ease of withdrawing and retreating from each other, further driving a wedge between us? Or will we do the hard, messy, and painful work of loving others, thereby seizing the opportunities God presents us to heal this broken world? It's tempting, especially in days like these in which we live, to pull back from the world and curse at the darkness. It's kind of like what John the Baptist did when he retreated to to the Judean wilderness. He was out there preaching a message of fire and brimstone to anybody who dared to listen. In Nikos Kazantzakis' novel, The Last Temptation of Christ, there's a scene in which Jesus and John the Baptist are arguing about their roles in God's plan for saving the world. It says this, John's face is hard, his eyes ablaze. Jesus asks him, isn't love enough? No, John answers with passion born of anger, the tree is rotten. God called me and gave me the axe, which I then placed at the roots of the tree. I did my duty Now you do yours. Take the axe and strike. Jesus quietly replies, If I were fire, I would burn. If I were a woodcutter, I would strike. But I am a heart, and I love. Like John the Baptist, we may want to show up with an axe and cut down everything that we think isn't of God. Instead, though, Jesus is willing to sow seeds of love into people's hearts and to wait for those seeds to take root, to sprout, and to grow into blossoms of love. And when those seeds flourish in our hearts, but also in the hearts of others whom God has planted the seeds in, then Our hearts work together in recreating the Garden of Eden. And we usher in the kingdom of God. But apart from love, there is no salvation. There is no Garden of Eden. There is no kingdom of God. And instead, we create a hell for each other. The writer of 1 John understood much like Jesus in the last temptation, that God and love are inseparable. He said, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. I think what the author of 1 John is trying to help us to see is that When we try to separate God from love, we diminish God, making God less than God is. Therefore, to act unlovingly, to deny love in any way, is to deny God. I love the way John Wesley wrote about this in his notes on this passage, in his scripture notes. He said, God is love. This little sentence brought St. John more sweetness, even in the time he was writing it, than the whole world can bring. God is often styled holy, righteous, wise. But not holiness, righteousness, or wisdom in the abstract, as he is said to be love, intimating that this is his darling, his reigning attribute, the attribute that sheds an amiable glory on all his other perfections. Of course, Wesley and the writer of 1 John are speaking of God's perfect love that draws us to him and then nurtures us and heals our broken spirits and then sets us free from our sin. 
And this is how we are to love one another, to live in such a way that our lives draw people in so that we can then nurture them with God's love, heal their broken hearts, and together we will both experience freedom from our sins. This is the kind of love that we must make central to our lives. And I think that our passage that Calvin shared just a moment ago gives us some good indication of how to do this. First, we must model our love for others after God's love for us. I've said it before, and I'll say it probably a thousand times more at least. Jesus is the perfect and complete representation of God's love. He came to show us love, but He also came to model how we should love. And again, in 1 John it says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. And to the writer's point, I think that human bodies make God's invisible love visible. Because God knew that we needed a visual representation of love, He sent Jesus to embody perfect love for us. But then, as you and I see and experience this perfect love, then we're called to demonstrate this kind of love to others to flesh it out. Khalil Gibran wrote, when you love, you should not say, God is in my heart, but rather, I am in the heart of God. To embody God's love for others is to help them see the love of God through our love. Wes Granberg Michelson describes it this way, the experience of true faith in the living God is always personal and never individual. He's not saying that it doesn't occur in our individual lives, but he's saying that it does not occur just for us individually. Rather, it is a spiritual journey that connects us intrinsically to the presence of God, whose love yearns to save and transform the world. We are called to be in Christ, which means we share always imperfectly, and always in community with others, we share the call to be the embodiment of God's love in the world. So, not only is God's love made visible through us, but we also need to recognize that God always loves first, regardless of how we respond. It's preemptive. God's love is there for us long before we ever even know we need God's love. Loving first must become our default position too. We love others, even if they don't love us in return, and their love for us is never a precondition for us loving them. One day, a little boy wanted to stay out playing in the yard. It was getting dark, and his father called him inside. But he didn't want to come in. And he began negotiating and bargaining with his father, trying to convince him that he needed to stay out a little bit longer. But his father wouldn't budge, and so finally the little boy said, I hate you. And his father just rather calmly said, Well, son, I love you. And the little boy just got even more fierce. He said, I hate you. And his father said, Son, I love you. And the little boy blurted out, don't say that. And he said that because he knew that there was no way he was going to win against his father's love. And that's true for us too. We may push back against this whole idea of loving, but love wins out. I think it's also important that we recognize that the more loving we are towards others, the more we sense, the more we become aware of God's love for us. 
When we love others, God's love isn't just made real to them, it's made real to us too. 1 John says, By this we know that we abide in Him, that we live in Him, and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent His Son as the Savior of the world. He did this as an act of love. God abides, God lives in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And they abide, they live in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. We have believed the love that God has for us. God is love And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. I'm not always as loving as I should be. And at times, if I'm truthful, I'm downright unloving too. But I have to move beyond that. And how do I do that? When I'm open to God's love for me, it instills a sense, a compulsion of extending that love to others. I realize that when I'm struggling to love others, it's often because I'm struggling to accept God's love for myself. Once I get my mind around how much God loves me, I can offer love to others more freely. First John says, love has been perfected among us in this that we know that we have the love of God in us, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. That abiding, that living in us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because He first loved us. Now, I was very fortunate. I had very loving parents. My father was a strict disciplinarian, but it was always done with love. When I would do something and my father would get angry and I knew discipline was coming, although I didn't feel good about the discipline that was to come, I did not live in fear. My only fear was the fear of disappointing my father. I didn't have to fear for my safety or my well-being. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. My father didn't punish me. He disciplined me, redirected me through love. When we love God, and we seek to live in love with others, then fear vanishes from our lives. Where there is love, we have nothing to fear. Therefore, since God loves us, we have nothing to fear. And if we love one another and continue to allow love to be our motivation for everything we do, we have nothing to fear, not even from each other. Now, my third point is possibly the most important, at least for our witness as a church. We need to recognize that love is the proof of our faith. 1 John says that it's impossible to love God and to hate others simultaneously. John wrote, those who say, I love God and hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from Him is this, those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters. So apart from love, there are no meaningful relationships. We can't be in a meaningful relationship with God if it's based on fear. It must be based on love. We can't be in meaningful relationships with each other unless it is based on love. Love is the source of all meaningful relationships because love is the most potent force in the world. Alice Gray wrote how in 1920, Lewis Laws became the warden at Sing Sing Prison in New York State, a prison at the time that was considered to house some of the worst offenders in the world. 
It was a dangerous place. As a warden, Laws instituted reforms and turned what was described as a hellhole into a model prison for rehabilitating offenders. He introduced sports team, sports teams, educational programs, and new methods of discipline based on respect for all persons. And the results were miraculous. But when he was asked about the transformation, Law said, I owe it all to my wonderful wife, Catherine, who is buried outside the prison walls. Catherine was a young mother with three children when her husband became the warden at Sing Sing. Everybody warned her that she needed to stay away from the prison, but Catherine had other ideas. As I said, he instituted sports activities, and at the first basketball game that took place in the prison, Catherine walked into the gym with her three beautiful children and she sat in the bleachers among the inmates. And this was her perspective. She said, my husband and I were sent here to take care of these men and we will take care of them and I believe they will take care of me. I have nothing to worry about. Catherine learned the names of the prisoners. She even studied their criminal records. She discovered that one convicted murderer was blind and so she went to see him and she asked, do you read Braille? And he said, what's Braille? And she learned Braille so that she could teach him. There was another prisoner who was deaf and unable to speak. Catherine learned sign language so that she could communicate with him. Many prisoners thought that Catherine was the incarnation of Jesus Christ because of the spirit that seemed to follow her wherever she went in the prison. Catherine continued working with the prisoners until an automobile accident took her life in 1937. The morning after Catherine died, even before the prisoners knew what happened, the assistant warden said that there was a sense among all the prisoners that there was something wrong and they were trying to figure out what was wrong, what had happened. When the assistant warden announced Catherine's death, it was like this huge gasp was let out and and the people immediately began to mourn. And Sing Sing was as quiet as it ever was because the men turned inward in their grief. The following day, Her body was lying in state at the warden's house, which was about three-quarters of a mile outside the prison gates. Mourners would come and offer their respects at the house. As the assistant warden took his morning walk that day, he noticed that a huge crowd of prisoners had gathered there at the main gate. Their eyes were filled with tears as they looked toward the house, the warden's house. And the assistant warden said to the guards, open the gates. And he told the men, you can go, but be back here in two hours. And the men walked that three quarters of a mile to go and stand in line to express their grief over the passing of Catherine. And every single one of them came back. They were different because they had experienced the power of Catherine's love. And it changed their lives forever. You see, love has that kind of power. The problem we face is that we don't trust love to transform the world. And that's why there's a war in Ukraine right now, because we don't trust love. That's why there was a shooting in Buffalo, New York last night, because we don't trust that love is enough. And a shooting the night before in Milwaukee. And the reason that we continue to hurt one another and divide one another, it's because we don't trust that love is the way. Until everybody is willing to give love a chance, we'll never see the full power of love at work 
And if by some miracle, we and everybody else finally decides to give love a chance, we'll see what the kingdom of God is really like because then we'll be living in it. Love is the way. Give love a chance. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Our closing hymn today is printed in the worship guide. We're going to sing these four verses of Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing.
Wow. <laughs> love is the only way. And until we give love a chance, we'll never really know that to be true. Go in peace and serve the Lord with gladness in all you do. Amen. Thank you.